Welcome, Emily. I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to you all tonight. So I'm going to be talking to you about Smokey the Beaver and how beavers build fire resistant landscapes. I don't think I have to convince anybody here that climate is changing. We are already feeling the impacts of it today with more on the horizon. So decade after decade after decade, we're seeing hotter and hotter temperatures. These are not confined to just one part of the continent. This isn't a California problem. This isn't a Texas problem. This is a continent-wide problem and it's getting worse. And we're starting to see that it's not just that the air is hotter, but there's other things that come with climate change that we need to deal with. We're seeing our reservoirs run dry and have a hard time refilling even when we do have a wet year. We're watching our forests uh, get affected by pests like beetles and emerald ash borers, become sick and unhealthy, and then with the smallest lightning strike, they go up in smoke and we have massive wildfires. And then finally, when we do get the rain that oftentimes we're very much wanting, it comes too much all at once and our riverscapes are not in a state where they can handle that much rain anymore. And so instead of this rain being great for us and sort of revitalizing the landscape, we find ourselves with catastrophic flooding in our lowlands. And all of these disasters are being exacerbated by climate change. As the world gets hotter, they are getting more intense. Historically, we have engineered our way out of these kinds of problems. We built these dams in the first place to make the reservoirs to store the water to get us through the droughts. We've created all this technology to do forest management. We figured out how to run sewer lines and sump pumps and all these other things to deal with flooding. So we're used to engineering our way out of things, but engineering is expensive. I used to work as an engineer. I, some of you may work as engineers. You know what engineer salaries are like. And if we are trying to engineer our way out of the global problem that is climate change, that runs a really high bill and it's a really big challenge. We may not have enough people force to do that. And so what I want everyone to start thinking about is not necessarily how we can get more of our own engineers on the landscape, but how can we start working with nature's engineers to accomplish some of these goals at a lower cost and in a more sustainable and naturally integrated way. And so, yes, I am talking explicitly about beavers doing some of this engineering work for us. Now, beavers and climate change. Uh, this is not as common of a phrase as peanut butter and jelly or salt and pepper uh, yet, but if I have my way, it will be because I think that beavers and climate change really do go hand in hand or hand in paw. Most of us know of beavers as nature's engineer. And if you were to walk out to a beaver dam landscape, you'd see something a little bit like this. There's tons of water out there. There's the dam on the left-hand side, creating a pond behind it. There's short vegetation, tall vegetation, live vegetation, dead vegetation. It's complex, it's messy, it's mucky, it's healthy. This is what so many of our riverscapes are supposed to look like. But unfortunately, most of our riverscapes don't look this way. A lot of them look a little bit more like this drawing in the bottom left. They're simplified, degraded streams. Instead of having these sort of complicated flow paths for the water to take, you just have one tight little ribbon of water that goes through the landscape. And over time, it starts to cut down deeper and deeper into the earth and it disconnects itself from its floodplain and that's called incision. And once a river or a stream gets incised, once it's not touching its floodplain and constantly overbanking and flooding out into the greater valley bottom, it can just go deeper and deeper and deeper forever, essentially, until it has no chance of reconnecting back to the rest of the landscape around it. And that has consequences. That water that runs through those rivers and streams, that should be connected to the soil so it can build up that great riparian wetland ecosystem, riparian meaning creekside or streamside. But when it's degraded, it can't. Luckily, that doesn't stop beavers. They see a degraded stream like this and they love it. They move in and they're like, I can fix this. This will be my home. And they start building their dam. And once they build that dam, a few things happen. Now the dam is a leaky structure. It's not like the concrete dams that we build. Water can flow through it, under it, around it, over it. Um, so water's constantly moving downstream still. It's not stopped, but it's absolutely slowed down. And behind the dam, you do raise the water level up and it starts to let that water reconnect with the floodplain. So not just in the form of water physically spilling out on top of the earth, but also through the soil. Because the water's slower, it has time to seep out into the soil around the stream, around the pond, and that rebuilds up this sort of earthen sponge of water. And that's what lets these riparian or riverside ecosystems flourish. That's what develops a wetland. 
Now, busy as a beaver is a phrase for a real reason. It is not just a fun alliteration. Beavers are not going to stop once they've built this one little dam. They see an opportunity to make that dam bigger. They want it to be taller. They want it to be longer. They want it to be stronger. They want to have a bigger pond to live in. And so they're going to keep working on this dam. It's going to create larger surface water area, and that's going to slow the water down even more, which is going to let more of it go out into the soil, and you build up a bigger ecosystem. You start to have this positive self-reinforcing cycle of slower water, more complex flow paths, and a happier beaver. Now, I can't see your all's hands, like when I give talks like this in person, but I just want you to think to yourself, have you seen a beaver in real life? And if the answer is yes, was it swimming or was it out walking around on the land? Most of us have seen them swimming. And when they're swimming, they are very agile. They are outstanding swimmers. They hold their breath up to 15 minutes. They have a second set of lips in their mouth. They can have a special third eyelid come down. They can close their nostril and shut their ears and basically turn their head into a little astronaut helmet so they can go underwater and stay there and navigate that system flawlessly. Amazing water creatures, but they are semi-aquatic. And semi means they do go on land. And I cannot say the same for when they are on the landscape. When beavers are out walking around, it's much more of a waddle than a walk. So a beaver is anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds. It has little grabby hands on the front, webbed back feet on the back, and then this huge paddle tail that drags behind it. All of this is attached to a body shaped like a bowling ball. And so when beavers are out on the landscape, they are vulnerable. They do not have that majesty and that protection that they have being amazing aquatic species. Um, and they know that. Evolution has taught them that. Um, the risk of predators is real. And so when beavers are building this water, uh, they're really just trying to keep themselves safe. And over time, they do have to venture further away from their ponds to access more food and building materials. Because once they chew on a tree that they like, that tree's going to... Um, potentially be killed, or if it's one of the trees they co-evolved with, like willow or aspen or any of the poplar family, it's going to start re-sprouting um, to grow more trees out of it. And the beavers hate the way those sprouts taste. So they're going to go further away looking for food. And they're not going to walk. Uh, they know that's not safe. They're going to dig canals. And those canals are going to be little water highways for them to get out across the entire valley bottom, across the entire landscape. These can be hundreds of meters long. And they're basically little tiny streams that the beavers are excavating and they're about one beaver width wide. And in theory, they're just one or two beaver widths deep. Um, but from my experience in the field, sometimes they go a little overboard and they can be five or six beaver widths deep. You don't know that until you step in it and you're up to your shoulders in water. Um, but these canals are amazing for the beavers. It lets them navigate the whole landscape without having to spend significant time on the land. These canals are also incredible for the floodplain and for the wetland health. Nothing can spread the water out across the landscape as effectively as these canals can. So given enough time for the beavers to do their work, you can transform that incredibly simplified system that can support almost no riparian ecosystem into a thriving self-sustaining wetland that spans an area much larger than the beaver pond itself. And this is important for all of those climate related disasters I mentioned, floods, droughts, fires, they all come back to water storage if you wanna be able to be more resilient and more resistant to them. So think again about the stream without any beavers. Simplified, not a lot of edge, noodle through the landscape. We're looking down on top of it in this image. And compare that with our beaver dam landscape. Much more complex, a lot of canals, upstream is connected to downstream, the dam is there, but it's leaky. Just a lot more going on. When we have a flood wave, and that flood wave could be from a big rainstorm, it could be from a large snow melt event, it could just be the annual high water that you get when it's a little bit rainier. Regardless, when you have a lot of water that's confined to a river that's degraded and unhealthy, there's not enough space for that water. And there is not a force on planet Earth that's more powerful and more erosive than water. And so when the water's in there with too much power and too much energy and not enough space, as it moves through these degraded systems, it literally rips them apart. And so while these feel like they should be excellent conduits for water efficiently moving it downstream, instead you see the thing that, that keeps rivers alive, water, is in there and it's destroying the river ecosystem because it's not in a state where it can handle that much water. But when you have wetlands along the river corridor, whether that's beaver wetlands or other wetland types, that takes the power out of the flood wave. Instead of being in this really tiny sort of narrow diameter hose of a waterway, you have broad water you have deep water, you have a lot more pathways for that water to take. And so as it moves downstream, it's slower, 
it's taken its time meandering through the floodplain, going in and out of the soil water system. The water does absolutely still make it downstream. I want to emphasize again, these beavers are not stopping the water. They don't hold it up there and hoard it forever, but they do slow it down and the downstream water has a lot less power in it. And it comes through a little bit slower, so you have more water later into the season. So instead of having all this erosion and soil loss and scouring in our riverscapes, if we just have some beavers in there doing their thing, we can see water bring, being spread and slowed and stored. That makes a difference beneath the ground, especially. Once again, we have the stream without beavers compared to the stream with beavers. This time we're looking with depth into the soil. On the top, I have little vegetation and all of their roots are sticking down into the dirt. We've got our stream and it's relatively small impact on the groundwater system on the left. On the right, we have the beaver pond. All those little canals are like micro streams on the top. And in both of these places, we have pretty deep water table. So I want you to imagine we're somewhere where you have to dig a bit to get to groundwater. Um, this doesn't mean it has to be like hundreds of feet deep. This could just be six or seven feet below the Earth's surface. Basically, you're not already in a wetland. Now, as long as we have something like rain or snow melt melting, uh, if there's some sort of an infiltrating precipitation into the soil, all these plants can stay green, they can all stay healthy, they can all be productive, and you don't really see the impact of the beaver there as much. But as soon as we enter a drought, which we are absolutely entering more and more and more, and the droughts are lasting longer and they're more intense, that's when beavers really start to shine. In our stream without beavers, a lot of those plants do not have access to soil water. Water is moving too quickly downstream. It does not have an easy pathway into the soil. The earth and sponge is dry. Groundwater is too deep. Uh, and so many of them start to wilt and wither and shut down and you get this dried out, crinkly, crunchy vegetation. Whereas when you had the beavers, because the water had so much time to get into the soil and because it was spread out so far across the whole landscape, the whole earth is like a full wet sponge. And all those plant roots can still access water, even if there's no rain, not a single drop. And this is something I personally studied uh, in Nevada and a few other places. And in one of the studies that I did, there was a three-year drought where maybe, I don't know, five inches of rain fell across the three-year period. It was dry. And these beaver wetlands did not lose their greenness and productivity that entire period. They had stored so much water that the riparian ecosystem was effectively being irrigated by the beavers the whole time. And if you were to look across this landscape, it was the only thing that looked anything like the beaver wetlands was the alfalfa fields that we were irrigating. And so the beavers were sort of mimicking another one of our tasks, which is keeping plants alive. And this matters a lot when you have this really dried out vegetation, if there's one careless match uh, or a power line, if you're in California or a campfire, if you're in Colorado or whatever is the main cause of your wildfires. When you have a fire start in the landscape, it's gonna burn anything that's dried out and easy to burn. And more and more, we are seeing our river corridors that dry out because they're unhealthy, act like a wick for the fire. There's tons of vegetation in there. And as soon as it gets dried out, that is an easy path for the fire to rip through. And we see this happening. We see rivers burning all the way down to the bottom. But when you have beavers in there doing their work, and when all this engineering is happening, it never really gets drought stressed. So it never dries out. And so when the fire comes through, it's just too wet to burn. This is actually pretty intuitive if you think about it. If you were to have a lit match in your hand and you're standing in this super dry landscape and someone says, hey, drop the match, I'm guessing most of you would say, no, bad idea, um, it's gonna burn. But if you're standing in a pond in a wetland and there's like water gushing out by your feet, if someone says, hey, drop the match, you'd probably be okay dropping it. I mean, you might still have other reasons to not wanna drop a match in the landscape, but it would probably not start a fire there. The match would just fizzle out because it's too wet to burn. And that's what we see. These beaver wetlands are too wet to burn. Now, these photos are from my colleague, Dr. Joe Wheaton at Utah State University. And he talk, took these from the 2018 Sharps fire, which burned in Idaho. Now on the left, we have that stream without beavers. And on the right is the stream with beavers. There's a pretty clear difference in how much burning happened here. Now, both these photos, the hill slopes burned. Uh, there's no beavers up there. It's very dry up there. The beavers can't affect it. It's not unexpected. Um, but what was unexpected is in the situation where there were no beavers, the fire came down the hill slope, burned straight through the valley bottom, burned right down to the river bottom, and then up the other side. And that should have been a place that was fire resistant. We used to use big rivers like this as an aid, as a fire break, as a place where we could do back burning from. And they're not reliable in that way anymore. You can see right here, the fire has no problem burning through the river corridor. It's not a safe spot. 
unless there's beavers there. In the beaver dam landscape, they'll slope still burn. Then the fire gets down to the edge of where the beavers are doing their engineering and it's just green. And then the whole valley bottom is green, but the fire goes up the other side. If you zoom in a little bit closer, the difference is even more striking. So in the left, in that picture without beavers, you see the blackened uh, charcoal landscape and all these little white blotches. And every one of those little white blotches is a pile of ash where there used to be a tree or a shrub, like a willow, and it's burnt to nothing. Uh, the soil here is burnt. The organic is burnt out of it. It's mineral soil now. It's going to be very hard to recover this ecosystem because it's been set so far back in its ecological state. But when we had the beavers, none of that happened. It's not that the fire wasn't strong here. If you really squint in like the bottom right hand side of that beaver dammed area photo, you can see one willow that burnt. It's like a little splotch on the bottom right. It's got a little bit of crispy bits around it. Uh, nothing else went though. It was just too wet to burn. And you've got that beaver pond, that sort of darker blotch of water. You've got those canals that are reflecting light back up at the drone and they look kind of illuminated. And that's the irrigation system that kept this area so soggy, so green and so protected. And that was all the work of the beavers. They did that all themselves. Now, when I'm seeing things like this, when I'm thinking about my understanding of beavers and drought resistance and fire resistance, I couldn't help but wonder if those Idaho beavers were just super lucky or is this something that beavers can do everywhere? Because with a lot of things, you can see it happen once and it's cool, but it's not really something you can operationalize or you can push for policy changes based on unless it's really happening everywhere. So to answer that question, I did a study and I looked at five fires across the American West. And at the time of the study, I thought these were all very big fires. I will come back to that because I don't think that anymore, but they were good sized fires, um, tens of thousands of acres. And they were across a variety of different ecosystems. Some were sort of scrubland, shrubland, some were forest. Um, some had been in a lot of drought before this, some had not been in as much drought. There was a lot of variety here, but what was consistent is that all of these fires had a lot of beavers within the fire perimeter. And so I figured if I am looking across all these different physical settings and fire conditions, and the beaver ponds are consistently green, then that means this is a serious effect and that beavers are a dominant controlling force in whether or not riverscapes can stay healthy during fire. And if it's not consistent everywhere, then I should be able to at least figure out where it does happen and where it doesn't happen. So to actually measure the impacts of the fire, I want you to imagine that you were walking along every creek in my study area from a designated starting point to a designated stopping point. And you stay really close to the creek as you're walking and you're gonna do this before the fire and you're gonna do this after the fire for all the different creeks in my study areas. As you walk along the creek, you're taking notes about how green the plants are, if they're healthy, if they're looking good, if they burned. Uh, and you're also taking notes about if there are beaver dams, beaver canals, beaver ponds, or other signs of beaver engineering. This is basically what we did in the study, except instead of going back in time and walking through active wildfires, we used satellite data to go back in time and extract pixels along the river corridor. So little tiny snapshots of the greenness of vegetation before the fire and then right after the fire, we also mapped out the presence of all of the different beaver dams and effects of their canal digging and other engineering. So I'm gonna show you some of the data that I got out of the study um, from the Manter fire, which burned in the Domeland wilderness of Sequoia National Forest back in 2000. This was a 79,000 acre fire, it was pretty big. Um, huge spoiler alert on this slide, there's me standing right in front of a beaver dam in Sequoia uh, National Forest in the Domeland wilderness. So the beavers are still there uh, today at least, but this is back in 2000 and 20 years is plenty of time for beavers to move back in. So that's not proof that they made it through the fire. Um, I also think this is a cool fire for a lot of reasons, but in this ecosystem, it's very rocky and it's very dry and it's very alpine. And somehow the beavers are absolutely thriving here, despite it not being what's considered ideal beaver habitat. And they've just built this huge network of dams. I've highlighted some of them in the satellite image and I've circled their beaver lodge in pink. It's hard to tell in this photo because it's an aerial image and sense of scale is difficult. But that thing is 60 feet across, six zero. It's huge. And in California, that's a minimum of a million dollar beaver lodge. So this is a massive complex. It's incredible. Um, they aren't all this big up in the dome land, but some of them are. So as I'm doing all this work and I'm, you know, mapping out these beaver dams, I'm getting pretty excited. I'm like, all right, these beavers are awesome. They're going to make it work. They're already overcoming a lot of challenges. But I also try to keep myself grounded in what these fires were actually like. And I find a good way to do that is to try to get some firsthand accounts of what it was like when the fire was burning. 
And since this one was a little ways ago, I looked for some newspaper articles and I found this one from the LA Times where they said that the Manta fire was a humbling expression of nature. Walls of flame, 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree, leaping through canyons and valleys at times in five directions at once, left behind quite literally is scorched earth. So this is not a trivial fire. This was a very serious fire. Beavers are big. I made that clear. They are not 70 feet tall. Um, they do not leap through canyons and valleys. So this fire should push the beavers to their limits. This should be very hard for them. Um, they're not in their own ideal habitat to begin with because it's dry and it's very alpine. And this fire is a very serious wildfire. But instead of just speculating about the future of the beavers, uh, I went ahead and started crunching all the numbers and getting the data. I'm gonna show you some of that. Now on the y-axis of this plot is NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This is a measure of plant greenness. The lower number means there, there are less or fewer green plants. A higher number means there's more green plants. NDVI scales from about zero to one, um, one being like the luscious jungle you've ever been in, zero being there's not a plant there. And then our x-axis is the distance along the creek profile. So thinking back, when you were walking along all those creeks in my study areas, your designated starting point would be zero, and then you walk, 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 and your designated stopping point here would be about 4,000 meters. So you'd walk about four kilometers, taking data as you go. And the plant greenness data looks something like this from before the fire. And because most people don't stare at NDVI plots all day, uh, these numbers don't mean a lot unless you put some context to them. So I've put a threshold on at 0.3, which is the minimum value I would expect to see in a healthy riparian zone during its growing season. So I wanna see the green above there. It doesn't have to be way above there, it can be. That can be a super dense portion of the riparian zone. Um, but as long as it's above that threshold, that's a healthy, happy riverside ecosystem. And most of it was like that before the fire. There's a few spots where it's dipped below and I did go ahead and zoom in and look at those in a little bit more detail. And they tended to just be pretty rocky areas. So there wasn't as much vegetation growing there for geologic reasons. But overall, the stream is looking pretty good. Uh, then the fire comes through, there are some changes. This is the brown curve now. For a while, it looks like it's not a massive change. And then it sort of dips off and it goes below that 0.3 threshold and it stays below it the rest of your walk along the creek. This alone is pretty interesting, but it gets to be a lot more interesting when you plot the positions of the beaver dams with little black boxes on our x-axis. So when we're looking in the place where the beavers are engineering, the data is not that different between the two years. And statistically speaking, these data are not different. These are not statistically different curves. Um, this is the normal amount of variation you would expect year to year, just given uh, if it was rainy a few days before or dry a few days before, this is normal variation in greenness. Uh, you go outside the beaver dammed area, this is not normal variation in greenness. This is a significant departure from its previous state. We're seeing a massive reduction in greenness of that vegetation, which given the context of this study, probably means it burnt because um, I looked right after the wildfire happened. And that difference was striking to me. So to make it even more clear, I'm now plotting the difference. And essentially what you're looking at is the effect of the fire. So a lower number means there's less fire effect and a higher number means there's more fire effect, more burning. When we're in the beaver dammed area, there's very little effect of the fire. They're seriously suppressing how much that fire can change the vegetation greenness and health and productivity in that ecosystem. As soon as we're out of the beaver dammed area, huge fire effects, really strong influence on the landscape. This indicates that the, not only is the beaver dammed area very resistant to burning, but the rest of the river, which in theory should be because it should be wet, is not. Um, it's not functioning the way we expect it to, it's burning. And I didn't just see this once. I saw this in every single creek I studied, in every single fire that I looked at. And overall, I found that the beaver dammed areas burned three times less intensely than the areas that didn't have any beavers within them. And I published these results in a study called Smokey the Beaver. And I was talking to a bunch of Forest Service folks on a webinar right around when I was doing this work. And I was talking about the Mander fire and how it was cool, but also scary and all this stuff. And afterwards, uh, one of them emailed me and he was like, I was on the burned area emergency response team for the Manta fire. Uh, and it's so interesting that you talk about all this stuff because when we were flying our post-fire reconnaissance, we took so many photos of the beaver dams. 
they were so fascinating. That's the only place that was green. And so he was like, you want to see the photos? I put them in a Google drive. And I was like, I would love to see the photos. Uh, and this is a photo that they took. Like I couldn't have asked for a better photo. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a creek with beavers. Um, they built a little dam that's channel spanning there. And on the right is one of the tributaries that didn't have any beavers on it. And you can see the effects of those walls of flame, 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree. That tree is burnt from roots to tip. And you can see that quite literally was scorched earth, the only thing left behind. There's piles of blackened soil and white ash. And you can see it tried to advance into the beaver dammed area. That fire burned the edge of the riparian zone at high severity, like it's burning soil as it tried to get in. And then it couldn't, it was just too wet. And this is incredible for a lot of reasons. Um, it's great for the beavers. It's also great for other animals. So when they were flying these surveys, they kept seeing everything else hanging out in the beaver ponds too. There are fish, there are frogs, there's birds, there's black bears that are just going here to be safe because it's the only place in the landscape that's not hot and ashy and on fire. And I find this uh, kind of beautiful for a number of reasons. One of which like this is ecological resilience that we didn't have to do. It's just doing it itself. All we had to do is leave the beavers alone. Um, it's also beautiful because somehow this bear has set me up for my favorite joke, which is that it looks like Smokey Bear got a helping hand from Smokey the Beaver. Of all the animals that could have been hanging out there looking so grateful, it was a black bear. Um, so this is great. Uh, I was feeling really good after this study and I'm like, all right, well, we've solved the climate change crisis, at least the fire portion with beavers. And I'll take my Nobel Prize and move on. Um, but unfortunately, science is never quite that straightforward, um, and climate change is definitely not like a one and done situation. Um, 2020 happened, and that was a tough year for a lot of reasons, but uh, it was a really tough year for fire, and it was really the dawning of the age of megafires. So a megafire uh, is really different than a normal wildfire like we're used to. Megafires are fires that have a burn area of larger than 100,000 acres. Now, just because a fire is big doesn't make it bad. And I want to be very clear about that. A lot of fire is good. We need it on the landscape. We want it. Um, fires can be very big and large and spanning a lot of area and still be good. Um, but most megafires we're seeing today are not good fires because they got to be that size by exhibiting really extreme behaviors that are outside the normal fire regime and that are self-sustaining and make the fire even worse. So one thing that they do once they get hot enough and get ripping is they make their own weather systems. So over the wildfire, you see what looks like a storm cloud, which is like, oh, good, it's going to rain on the fire and put out the fire. But it's not a normal storm cloud. That's a pyrocumulus cloud. And instead of raining down water, it rains down ember and ash. And ember and ash then lands in the surrounding landscape, causes secondary ignitions or smaller secondary wildfires that then merge with the primary wildfire, make it bigger, make it stronger, make it hotter. And then it can create what looks to be like a supercell thunderstorm cloud. But again, instead of rain, uh, it's not rain. These are pyrocumulonimbus clouds that if you've ever seen the viral videos can create fire tornadoes and fire storms. And these are exactly what they sound like. Instead of having heavy rainfall, um, you have heavy firefall. Or instead of having a normal tornado, which we already can't manage, uh, you have a fire tornado. So it looks like a normal tornado, but it's made of fire. And that's a problem. It's a problem from a management perspective. It's very challenging to deal with fires that have that behavior. It's a problem ecologically. When they are creating these really dramatic weather systems, it often leads to explosive spread, spread rates. Uh, we've seen 100,000 acres of spread in a day. That is so far beyond what we have any ability to control. And when a fire is moving that fast and that intensely, the only thing we can focus on is getting people out of the way. There's nothing else to do. And it also leaves behind these huge patches of moderate and severe burning. In a normal wildfire, you have some moderate and some severe burning. That's normal. Um, it is usually sprinkled around, that's called pyrodiversity, or you make a fire mosaic where there's a lot of different intensities all together. It actually makes the landscape more resistant and more resilient to future wildfire. Uh, not what we have. We have just 40,000 acres of severe burning all together. And that's a problem because that can destroy ecosystems that can cause massive secondary hazards. Um, it's just not something we want, but unfortunately it's something we have. So given this, um, and given 2020 and the fact that the megafires haven't stopped, uh, if any of you have followed what happened in Canada this past year, the boreal forests had a real wake up call about what megafire looks like in Canada. And we had a real wake up call about what air quality looks like when wildfire is that bad in Canada. Um, so this is something we need to deal with ASAP. 
And I wasn't 100% sure if fevers were still going to be part of that solution because these are really extreme behaviors. There's a big difference between a beaver keeping its wetland intact during a normal wildfire and a beaver protecting its wetland from a fire tornado. These are not the same situation. So I wanted to study that and look at it. Um, and because this is easily the grimmest part of my talk, um, spoiler alert on this slide, that is a mega fire burn scar and that is a beaver wetland in the middle of it. So at least sometimes this can still work. So don't feel too much doom and gloom quite yet. Uh, but we don't know if this happens all the time. And megafires are really intense and they're happening in a lot of landscapes. So I wanted to answer this question. And I wanted to look somewhere that hadn't had a lot of megafires before. I could have looked in California easily because there's tons and tons of megafires there. But it gets complicated because there's also a huge amount of fire mitigation work happening on ground. There's a huge amount of burn scar already in the landscape that the fires can sort of bleed into and it changes their behavior. I didn't want to study that. I wanted to study the most out of control, unhindered mega fires that I could. And luckily for me and unluckily for Colorado and the Rocky Mountains that happened in 2020, they had three mega fires that burned simultaneously uh, in a pretty small area. And Colorado had not had mega fires like this for over a hundred years. And that is a word of caution for anybody who lives, works or enjoys landscapes that feel like they are not a place where fire happens. Um, I'm in Minnesota. I talked to this, talked to people in Minnesota about this a lot. Um, we have a lot of fuel and Colorado had a lot of fuel. We have not had fires like that in about a hundred years. Colorado had not had fires like that in about a hundred years. And then they did. And they had three at once and it was massively destructive. So I studied these fires as like the case example of the worst possible scenario. These fires were extreme. Um, They're mega fires by definition of size and by definition of behavior. It was the East Troublesome Fire, the one at the bottom of my map here that burned 100,000 acres in a day. It was supposed to burn itself out because it was going for the Continental Divide, which is very high, rocky, alpine, scree covered mountains, like no fuel up there. Uh, and so it was burning up, 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 up. And it just jumped right over and burned down the other side because it had such a strong weather system that it had created over itself. Um, and that was not expected. People really thought the Continental Divide was going to stop it or at least slow it down, and it didn't. Um, so these were really intense wildfires. And they had a lot of beavers within them. The Mullen Fire at the top uh, had 926 satellite visible beaver dams. Cameron Peak Fire in the middle had 99. And then East Troublesome Fire at the bottom that had 512. The map I'm showing you, by the way, is burn severity, where red is high severity, um, blue and white is unburned or low severity, or something called enhanced regrowth, which means it actually did a little bit better after the fire. That's like a good burn, prescribed burn situation. Um, you probably don't see much blue and white in there. It's all red. Uh, these fires were bad. But with 1,500 beaver dams uh, across the three, I figure if I'm going to see the beavers fail, if I'm going to see them not be able to keep their wetlands green, I will find those examples in these fires because they're extreme fires and there's a lot of beaver ponds to look at. So I went through and I always do ask myself, like, why am I going through all this complicated satellite analysis when we can see the beaver ponds staying green? If you look at satellite images of beaver ponds all day, just like me, then you've already found them in this picture and you're like, wow, those are some great beaver ponds. And if not, uh, rest assured, all you have to do is wait for everything to burn and they're very easy to find. So once you burn the landscape, I should say once the landscape burns, don't make a habit of burning the landscape yourself. Uh, those beaver dams stand out because everything around them is green. The beaver ponds are those black wedges. That's the open water surface. The dam is on the right hand side of most of those wedges. You can kind of see that sort of curvy linear -ish shape um, and everything around them is fine. And this is a very recent post fire photo. You can see how intensely it burned right next to the beaver wetland. It's not that these are places where fire is not affecting it. These are places where the beaver is protecting the landscape from fire. And so in addition to being able to see it with our eyes, something I've learned in my career as a scientist is that a lot of folks need more than just to see it. They need the numbers. They need to know how much greener it is, how much more protected it is. Those are the kinds of things that drive policy change and that can generate funding and get the work done to support beavers. And when I use satellites, I can use a measure called D and BR to get those numbers. Now, if you're a satellite nerd, this slide is for you. Uh, if you're not a satellite nerd, the sentence at the bottom is for you. Um, D and BR is the differential normalized burn ratio. And so what it does is it takes advantage of the fact that 
burned areas and healthy vegetation reflect light really opposite of one another in near infrared and shortwave infrared portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we're near infrared, we have our healthy veg reflecting a lot of light, burned areas hardly reflect anything. Move out to shortwave infrared, the opposite is true. Burned areas reflect a lot, healthy veg is hardly reflecting anything. Because of that difference being so large, we can do a pretty classic satellite index where we minus them on top, add them on bottom, and then difference it. And that tells us how much burning or how severe the burning is in the landscape. Now, a higher DMBR means an area is more burnt. It has higher burn severity. And then I can go through the landscape and I can calculate this at every 10 by 10 meter pixel across the whole burn scar. And I can overlay that with the positions of beaver dams and figure out exactly how burnt or unburnt every piece of the landscape is. How burnt or unburnt are the beaver wetlands? What about the rivers that didn't have beavers in them? What about the rest of the landscape that's just out there, unprotected and totally at the will of the fire? I went through and I calculated these values. Um, and it looks like my legend got a little bit cut off here. So the light gray box, those are the areas outside of the riverscape. So that is when we're out on the hill slopes where the beavers cannot do any of their engineering. The medium gray box in the middle, that is our riverscapes where there are no beavers. So we're in the river corridor, it should be wet, um, but there's no beavers doing their work. And then the darkish gray boxes on the right of each of those panels, that's the beaver dammed areas. Now those dashed lines, that's the burn severity thresholds. In a healthy, uh, resilient landscape, we would expect those boxes to be sitting down somewhere around low severity with their just tendrils going up into the moderate and high and tendrils going down into the unburned or nothing else. Um, it's not what we saw. Both in the areas outside the riverscape, those light gray boxes, and the riverscapes that didn't have beavers, those medium gray boxes, they were sitting up in the moderate sphere burning area. Um, that means we have too much intense burning in this landscape. And that was true in Cameron Peak, it was true in East Troublesome, it was true in Mullen. It's concerning to me that there's not really a difference between outside the riverscapes and riverscapes without beavers. Why would the river be acting like it's a hill slope? Why would it be burning like it has no access to water? That doesn't make sense if it's a healthy river. So this is uh, a damning uh, look at the rivers here, not in that they are damned, but then it is, uh, it's not good. Um, except if we have beavers. Those boxes where we have beaver dams are so much lower and so much smaller boxes than outside the riverscapes or in the riverscapes without beavers. And that tells me two things. One, these are not burning anywhere near as severely as the rest of the landscape. And two, it's reliable and it's consistent. Um, it, there's not a lot of variability here. It's not a gamble if you're in a beaver pond where you're gonna be, is it gonna be high severity burning or low severity burning? Those boxes are sitting really tight right down in the low severity and unburned area. They are protected in all three fires. When we put it in the context of the landscape, if you are outside of the riverscape, only 40% of that area is fire refugia. That means that only 40% was unburned or low enough severity burning that it was not dangerous to the ecosystem or plants and animals living within it. That's not good odds. Um, and outside the river or in the river, but with no beavers was not a lot better. 52% of that area is fire refugia. That's the equivalent of standing in a riverscape and flipping a coin. And if it's heads, the riverscape burns. And if it's tails, it doesn't. Um, I'm not happy with those odds. I don't think anybody who works in rivers should be happy with those odds. But when you're in the riverscape with beavers, 89% of that area was fire refugia. Those are good odds. That is a reliable patch of landscape that's not being burnt up. And I did look at the 11% that wasn't fire refugia and I found two things. First, a lot of it is that sort of fringe burning. So the fire gets up to the edge of the beaver wetland, it burns the edge, but it doesn't get all the way in. When I classify these beaver dammed areas, I include the edge. And so some of that edge area does burn. The other thing I saw is very new beaver dams when they're isolated from all the other beaver dams, so probably a dispersing beaver going off to make its new habitat, totally alone, just built its first dam that year. And then the fire comes through, those did burn. And that doesn't surprise me too much because they had less than a season to store water. And that's just not enough time to store up enough water to deal with fires of this intensity. I think that those beaver dams probably would have been fine in a less intense fire, but not when you have 100,000 acres of spread in a day. And that was the rest of the unburned or of the overly burnt beaver dammed areas. Everything else was reliable. Uh, 
which to me is great because if I ever get caught in a wildfire, I know where I'm going and it's to the closest beaver pond because everything else feels a little bit too dicey for me. And it's cool because with satellites, we can actually watch this happening in real time. Enough of the satellites are now beaming down data every day that we can find out where the beavers are doing their damming, look right before a fire comes through. That's the October 6th image, 2020, where everything's green, all the veg is healthy. And then right after the fire comes through, October 22nd, 2020, uh, I guess the fire is still coming through in this image. You can literally see the fire burning both sides of those beaver wetlands and not burning into them. This is something that we can observe without having to physically be in the fire that just reinforces. It's not that the fire wasn't near these wetlands. It's not that they're just sort of protected in the valley bottom. Uh, they're not burning because they're protected because of the engineering the beavers did. And that's important. It's important during the fire. This is the view you would have had if you were a beaver during one of these mega fires, looking out over the landscape, surrounded by all this green lush willow and a nice cool pond with clear water. And if you don't look up too high, you wouldn't even know a fire had burnt. Um, but I'm sure the beavers did because as they're hunkered down in this pond, they are absolutely encircled with flames. There's fire walls surrounding them. There's smoke everywhere. Um, I'm sure the sunlight was completely blacked out by the smoke. But the beavers make it and they survive. And at this site, at least, I went after the fire and the year after the fire and then two years after the fire. And those beavers had babies and they're doing great and the family's thriving. Um, so they can make it through these events if we just let them do their thing and be beavers and not mess with them too much. And it's good for all the other critters that need to have somewhere to go during the fire and then after the fire to find food and water. And it's good for all of the plants that are preserved in their adult mature state and can put out seeds and shoots and sort of boost the rest of the landscape around them ecologically post fire, instead of making it super easy for all those very opportunistic invasive plants to find their way in. And if none of that is convincing you that beavers are worth our time, perhaps dollar signs will. Uh, I always think there's pros and cons to putting a dollar sign on an animal, especially a dollar sign on the ecosystem services they provide, but it's good to put it in perspective. This study from 2020 uh, looked at all the different things that beavers are doing to help us, all their different ecosystem services. And this was before fire was something that was really being talked about. So when they looked at moderation of extreme events, they were just looking at floods and droughts. They looked at greenhouse gas sequestration. They looked at water purification, water supply, recreational hunting and fishing, um, tons of duck hunting and fishermen activities happening at beaver ponds because they're such biological hotspots habitat and biodiversity provisioning, nutrient cycling, um, historical value, non-consumptive rec. Put all these things together and beavers are doing $179,000 of ecosystem services per square mile they engineer per year. So this is a high return on investment. We invest nothing. Um, we just let them be beavers. We get back a lot every year we let them be beavers. Every additional year that you tolerate a beaver on the landscape is $179,000 per square mile of work that we didn't have to pay someone to do. And I'm kind of happy this figure came out the way it did because that's about the cost of a high level engineer. And so instead of us paying $179,000 for one person to manage one square mile, um, we're just getting that value back for free. So this is really great. It's motivating. Um, now what, what do we do with this information? Where do we even go from here? Uh, is it time for us to start airdropping beavers across North America again? Uh, it is really, again, we did this. Uh, I don't know how many of you encountered this nonsense before, but back in 1940s and 1950s, uh, we had some extra parachutes after the war and beavers were moving into some cities in the Western US and Idaho fishing game and California fishing game. California sometimes doesn't acknowledge as publicly that they were part of this. Thought, you know what we should do? pack beavers into boxes, put a parachute on it, push it out of an airplane, repopulate the landscape where we want them. And they did this. Um, and it was successful. As far as they told us, um, they had successful drops, they had colonization. Um, this poster from Outdoor California by Fish and Game, I really like how transparent it is about what they were doing. They said beaver dams in the mountains save water for fish, wildlife, and agriculture. These beavers are live trapped by the department in farm areas where there could be damage. And then they are transported, sometimes by parachute, to the mountain industry, or sorry, to the mountain areas where their industry and skill will benefit the state. Um, so 70 years ago, we knew beavers were helpful. And then honestly, we have just sat on that for 70 years. Um, not a lot has been done since then. Beavers have gone in and out of style. People have 
fallen back in many places to viewing them as pests and thinking, oh, we should just get these things off the landscape. But at least in the last 10, 15 years or so, we're seeing it pivot back once again. We're starting to see people get excited. We are not going to start airdropping them again. I want to be clear, that is not what's next. That is not the now what. We have better technology for moving beavers that doesn't involve parachutes. Um, but there's still work to do. There's a lot to do. And I think we need to think about not just better understanding what beavers can do to the landscape, but also how we are changing what they do to the landscape. Obviously, we're making a big change when we lethally remove beavers. So when we um, trap them out and remove them from the landscape in an attempt to permanently remove them, which doesn't usually cause permanent change, um, beavers move back in the following year in many cases, that's going to remove their effect overall. But we don't just kill beavers. We also do a lot of things that are are trying to live with beavers and co co coexist with them. We live trap beavers and move them, not with parachutes. We put in pond levelers. These are sort of big pipes that go through the beaver dam. Um, that's the bottom middle picture that can take the level of flooding down just a bit. So if you're starting to make it so that a road is a little bit underwater or a basement's underwater or a field's underwater, you take the flooding down just enough so that you don't have infrastructure damage, but there's still enough water for the beavers to live there. We build things like beaver dam analogs, fake beaver dams. That's what's happening in the middle top picture with all those people in hard hats. We go out and try to build fake little beaver dams in hopes that we can attract beavers to a site we want them to build at. Of course, we don't build the same way beavers do. Um, we use heavy machinery sometimes, or we use light machinery sometimes. And we're not exactly sure if a beaver dam that's naturally built versus a beaver dam that's partially natural and partially us versus a beaver dam that's 100% us. We don't know how those all differ in their effects yet. We also uh, wrap trees in wire fencing, which the picture on the right, you may not believe, was wrapped in wire fencing. Um, we don't always do this the best we could. Uh, people forget how big and strong beavers are. So if you wrap it with chicken wire, no chance. Beaver's going to crush that. Um, if you wrap it too short, beavers are tall. Sitting on their hind legs and on their haunches, they're easily three feet tall. And they'll put their little paws up on top of a fence and squish it. Um, and they'll access the tree. Or they'll dig under it and access the tree. So sometimes this isn't effective. But when it is effective, when we do successfully wrap our trees, how does that change the beaver's ability to engineer the landscape? In wetter places like Ontario, there's been some research showing that they still have pretty good fire resistance in beaver wetlands, but it's not because they're soggier. It's because of how they change the forest structure around them. It's because they're cutting trees and letting younger, more vibrant plants grow in. And if we stop them from doing all that cutting, are we gonna reduce the fire resistance? We don't know. A um, lot of questions to answer there. This isn't to say we shouldn't start partnering with beavers right now. There's a lot to be done and it's all hands, all paws on deck. But I do want to advocate that as we work with beavers, as we try to help them or change their behavior, we take data so that we know what works, what doesn't work, and what the effects of all of our actions are. So we don't go set up the beavers to thinking we're going to make a great fire break, it not work for some reason, and we have no idea why. So to summarize all that, there's more re research needed, and there's a lot of collaboration needed. If we want to roll this out, it can't just be scientists like me um, taking data. It can't just be practitioners and land managers out on the ground putting in structures and acting uh, either positively or ne negatively with the beavers. It can't just be policymakers coming up with ideas and passing legislation through. Uh, we all need to be talking to one another because beavers are second only to us in their ability to modify the physical landscape. They are really, really powerful in what they do, and that can be inspiring and really effective, and it can also be really challenging. Um, we have to give up control when we work with beavers, and that pushes people out of their comfort zone a lot. So making sure that everyone's talking together, everyone's working together, and communication is open is really important for actually working with beavers effectively. And of course, continuing to ask those research questions, figure out when and where this is most effective, where should we prioritize doing this kind of work, where is it maybe a back burner situation, um, and is there a limit? At what point are beavers not going to be able to help us with things like fire anymore? And how do we make sure we never get there? Like, I don't think the beavers are going to be able to deal with like a volcanic eruption level wildfire. Um, but I, don't, I hope we don't have that kind of wildfire happening all over the country. Um, but I want to make sure that we never have to find that limit if we can get our fires under a little bit more control before we get there. So hopefully I have you convinced that beavers and climate change really is the same as peanut butter and jelly. And I am happy to answer any questions you all have.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Emily. And um, I am happy to say that we have a good amount of time for questions. Let me check my, yeah, we have a good 30 minutes for, for questions. So um, I see that we have a couple already and Kristen's going to help. Um, so Emily, you don't have to look at that. Um, Kristen will uh, read the questions and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we have one comment I'll share first. Um, our friend Karen Hans from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife um, shared another example of beaver dams enduring high severity fire was the bootleg fire in South Central Oregon Sprague River Basin. So I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, that was one she shared that was comparable. Um, and then a question came in um, kind of early in your talk. How many beavers were associated with the Sharps fire sites? This is multi-part. Um, is there a generally accepted number of individuals needed to yield such a result? Um, it's such a stark difference between beaver presence and beaver absence. So how many beavers and how many do you need or do you know that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first, I do know the bootleg fire and the spoiler on my mega fires slide, um, where I was like, don't worry, some of them make it. That was actually a photo from the bootleg fire, um, oh. really outstanding fire refugia and a really good case study of the fire refugia benefiting fish after fire. Um, mm -hmm. But for the Sharps fire question, I believe the Sharps fire had uh, somewhere on the order of like 500 beaver dams in the whole watershed that burned. Um, that specific section, that's just one family. Uh, you don't need a ton of beavers to get fire resilience. Beaver families on average are going to be building and maintaining somewhere between five and 10 dams. So each dam in my study areas is responsible for preserving around two to three acres of habitat. So if you have one beaver family build 10 dams, you're looking at 20, 30 acres of wetland that's preserved. That's a large area. It's a noticeable area. It's also enough area to keep the food resources available so that the beavers don't just like immediately starve themselves out after the fire when a lot of the landscape does burn. Um, there's also an example of a fire in Northern California, um, the Beckworth fire, which was, it burned right adjacent to the Dixie fire same year, um, which like combined between the two of them, it was over a million acres burnt. It was really intense. There's one field site, uh, up by Frenchman Reservoir, where I knew there were some beavers. I knew there was one family of beavers and they were totally isolated from everything else. Like no beavers in either direction for several kilometers. Fire came through there super hot, burnt people's cabins down, um, severe burning, pine trees dead all over the place. And it was such a small beaver wetland that I could barely tell in satellite imagery because it was so coarse what happened there um, after the fire. So I went up and I visited on ground and driving through that landscape, uh, just like horrifying. Like you're going up there and everything is dead. Everything is absolutely burnt to a crisp. There's not any life. It's creepy because of how quiet it is. Like you don't hear animals, you don't hear birds, you don't even hear the wind other than like trees groaning because they're dead. Um, and then I turn around the corner and I park at a place where I can launch my drone and I get my drone up in the air and I send it over to the beaver wetland. And it's freaking perfect it's all green there's not a single bit of burning within it even the pine trees that were in the beaver wetland that are tall and could have caught an ember they didn't burn um it's totally intact it looks fine but granted like that's still a small area maybe it was super hot in there so i go out and i visit it on ground and i hang out there all day and i wait till night and as the sun is setting i can hear the baby beavers like grumbling to their parents and so I know there's a family in there and then I keep waiting quietly as I can without being like too excited um, and I see the beavers come out and they're circling around and there was not time for a new beaver family have to have moved in and settled that site so the beavers not only survived but they felt comfortable enough and safe enough that they had babies the next year um, which they won't if they're super stressed so it only took one family of beavers to preserve their whole wetland and to thrive there. And they're still fine. I just visited them again last year and they're doing great. Um, you don't need a lot, but it's better if yeah. there's more because there's more protection, but you just need one family. Um, thank you. It's kind of heartwarming, I guess. Um, uh, what, another question. I've heard that wetlands can capture four times more carbon than a forest. Um, any comments on this or or anything to add or mm -hmm. share about that? Yeah, there's a group in Colorado that studies carbon sequestration in beaver meadows um, at Colorado State University. It's led by Ellen Wool, And she has a really great study 
that looked at sediment cores from beaver meadows where the beavers had been doing their work for thousands of years. Um, and then grassland degraded riverscapes where there wasn't that kind of connection. And I wanna say that there was 11 to 13 times as much carbon storage in the beaver meadow as in the degraded riverscapes. Uh, that's massive. Like that's a lot of carbon storage in the soils. And beaver wetlands are kind of unique because all wetlands give off greenhouse gases too. So there's gonna be methane that comes out of them. There's gonna be carbon dioxide that comes out. Whether or not it's a carbon source or a carbon sink depends on how much they can interact with the floodplain around them. Because when you have an overbanking event, when you can deposit sediment and get that water out onto the floodplain to stimulate the vegetation, that vegetation is what's pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And beaver ponds are really, really good at that. And so they are excellent at sinking carbon down and locking it away in soil. Whereas other wetland types that are less dynamic don't have that ability. Mm -hmm. Um, what are, uh oh, move, asking new questions. Okay, what are the most common land manager objections to beavers and how do you, if you do, address these concerns? Good question. Uh, it's a little bit location dependent. So a really common objection to beavers is flooding, uh, especially when beavers dam up culverts. Um, those little pipes that go under roads, if you're not familiar with the term. And Beavers love culverts so much. It's like the perfect thing for them. It's such an easy, like they just have to plug it a little bit to get a great pond. Um, Cause we've already put a road somewhere it probably shouldn't belong. And it's really easy to flood it. So I joke, like we need to stop building beaver dam analogs to attract beavers to sites. We just need to build like fake little culverts cause they'll show up and dam them. Um, they freaking love those things. Uh, and it's problematic cause we put them by roads. And so when beavers are damming up culverts they are flooding roads. Um, that's a really common complaint. Um, Tree loss is another common complaint when you're in an ag system out in California. It's almond farmers and pistachio farmers that really have a problem with beavers cutting their trees um, that they're growing next to rivers, which are like beaver highways. So it's complicated and it's easily solved with fencing. Um, and the culvert issue is easily solved with fencing. Fencing actually, not like fencing like a sword, but like putting up fencing keeps beavers away um, pretty well. The other concern that I hear sometimes is fish passage issues. And this one's interesting because it's really divided. So out west, Oregon, Washington, California, Colorado, there's a huge amount of data showing that beaver ponds are really beneficial, especially for salmonids like steelhead and salmon and things like that. And that vast majority of these fish have no problem getting around beaver dams. They don't need to jump over it like nat National Geographic style waterfall jumps. Um, Beaver dams are porous enough that actually most baby fish can swim straight through them. The water is going through in big enough sort of pipeways. Uh, the canals that beavers are digging, they're not just out, they connect upstream to downstream. Beavers also don't wanna walk over their dam, it's hard. And so if they can make those water pathways, they will. Um, and fish take them all the time. They'll just swim upstream to downstream, bypass the dams. Uh, and in really low periods, low flow periods, um, you can have temporary stranding of fish either in the pond or elsewhere. But when the water flow is that low, I would rather have the fish in a pond than out in a stream that's drying up. But then you come out to the upper Midwest uh, and there's still a lot of concern that beavers are a problem for the trout. And I think a lot of that concern is coming from the fact that there's very, very little data on that. Um, there haven't been the same number of studies out here that there were out West. They don't know because the landscapes here are different um, topographically and ecologically if there is a problem. I suspect there's not, given that both of these species have lived in the same habitat for 7 million years, but um, there's still conflict and there's still concern about that. And I have a lot of conversations up here about, did you know that baby fish can swim through a beaver dam? And sometimes people just don't know because uh, nobody's measured it, nobody's recorded it. So those are the main concerns I run into. Most things can be solved with fencing um, or a little bit of a deterrent, but some of them are a little more challenging, like when beavers burrow into levees, um, that one's a hard one to deal with because it can mm -hmm. potentially destabilize the levee and it's hard to fence off a whole levee. Um, okay, is there evidence that beaver complex wetlands slow down or even stop lower intensity fires? Yes, um, there is. In these low intensity burns, I've been like, definitely biasing my studies to look at the worst of the worst, because I figure that's where the beavers will fail. But I just casually look at a lot of fires across the Western US, little ones too, um, and up in Canada and in the Eastern half of the continent. Low intensity fires have no chance. They get up to these beaver wetlands and they just stall. 
Um, there's a good case of a fire that burned uh, up in the Metau Valley in Washington. And it was not as intensive a fire. It burned up to a beaver wetland. It stopped. The firefighters uh, did a little bit of a backburn off the other side of the beaver wetland. And that was the fire break. And that actually protected structures and stopped um, a lodge from burning down. Um, so they can absolutely still function as fire breaks. And I would suspect that in like a really low intensity fire, like a grassland fire um, or just a little shrubby fire, that's when you would see more true fire breaking behavior instead of just uh, refugia patches. Um, Ken Beerley says hello, and he's looking forward to your work in the Harney Basin. It will be a great conversation starter in the community. So Yay. sharing that one. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Um, let's see. I uh, think I've read where beaver expansion in the far north is having unanticipated climate impacts, maybe increased permafrost melting. Is there any truth to this? It's a great question. Um, for a little bit of context, beavers are currently pushing further north into the Arctic on to thawing permafrost landscapes where shrubs have started to grow. Beavers see shrubs and they're like, mm, tasty, and they move in. Um, and if you have open water on the permafrost during winter, that can increase your thaw rate. In the last 10,000 years, uh, beavers have been in the Arctic multiple times. They have gone all the way up to the very tip top of the Arctic. They've built their dams. Every time the Arctic warms, beavers move in. So this isn't a brand new phenomenon. They're not an invasive species there. Um, if they do con contribute to permafrost thaw, which I'm sure they do in localized places, it's just one of the things that's happening as they move up. I'm also seeing fire resistance in Arctic landscapes where fire is burning the peatlands that are draining as the permafrost thaws. So it's a little bit more of a complicated balance of pros and cons in the Arctic, if you want to have a beaver in that landscape or not. Um, but it's also a little bit of a moot point, because if you want them there or not, doesn't matter. They're there. Um, they're making their way north. We cannot eradicate them. We should not eradicate them. Um, so it's more of a challenge of how do we manage the species, live with the species in this new to us situation, um, and understand what to expect as they move into these landscapes. Permafrost is thawing regardless. Um, climate change is not in a good place. Uh, and so that is part of climate change. Um, beavers were not the ones that put all the CO2 into the atmosphere, but the permafrost thawing does contribute to that as well. We don't know what the magnitude of it is. We don't know how it compares to human emissions of CO2 and methane. Um, but if beavers were there 8,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago, and the Arctic refroze and it turned back into permafrost, that should at least let people know that beavers moving up there now does not necessarily mean it's a permanent change. This is part of the natural cycle of a changing Arctic as climate warms. Um, what are some management actions that can promote beaver colonization in a forested landscape? Uh, food availability seems to be limiting in landscapes that were managed for timber in Western Oregon. And our question comes from the North Oregon coast for context, but I would say it's similar true for us in the Willamette Valley in these managed timber lands um, and food availability. Yeah, it's tough. Um, planting willow is honestly one of the best ways if you can just get a little bit of willow going. Um, beavers love it. And it's a sort of a balance when you very first plant willow, if the beavers move in right away, it will cut it all down and there won't be enough time for the willow to really be established. If the beavers give the willow like a year or two, or if you fence the willow, you plant off so the beavers cannot access it in the first couple of years. Then when the beavers come in and start chewing, that stimulates a lot of growth in the willow. There's a research paper, I think it came out of New York um, like 50 years ago. And they were looking at forests that had beavers chewing in them and forests that didn't. And they found that where beavers were chewing, there was actually significantly more willow biomass than in places where there was not, which makes sense because mm -hmm. the beavers are gonna chew the stick, scrape the bark, and then they just leave the stick there or they put in their dam. Willow can clone and it's gonna clone from those little chewed up sticks. And that's why in landscapes where beavers have been damming a long time, you can actually find the fossil beaver dams by looking at the landscape from above and seeing a curvy line of willows cut across a big wet meadow. That's the old beaver dam. It's growing willow out of where they were chewing it and then putting it on their dam. I see these all the time in Wyoming. They're absolutely amazing. Um, so get the willow started, keep the beavers off of it for a little while, um, and then let the beavers go ham because they can regenerate that willow in the forest. Can you overwhelm the beavers? Like if you plant a large enough section that they're just 
sort of nibbling at the buffet sort of endlessly or <laughs> they would love that it would be their dream if they had that um ironically the other thing that helps beavers in forested ecosystems is fire um fire knocks down the pines pretty intensely mm -hmm. and it makes room for things like willow and aspen to come back up which are a faster growing and more fire resistant species uh so in the upper midwest which is also very forested when we have fire come through a lot of aspen comes up afterwards and then beavers move in like nobody's business so not again don't start your own wildfires but when they do happen uh that is an opportunity for the beavers to come back in greater numbers afterwards Okay, next question. We've got a few more here. Um, considering the importance of roads, have there been studies of the intersection of beaver complexes and roads or best practices for those to coexist? It's a great question. Um, studies? No. None that I'm aware of, at least none that are published. Um, knowledge and information about it? Absolutely. Um, there was recently a report to Colorado Department of Transportation because they have uh, I-70 across the state east to west, and it is a major, major trucking route. Um, the like drainage, it runs through a valley, as most of our highways do, and the ditch next to it is just chocked full of beavers, like infinite beavers, it feels like. Um, so there's no chance they're going to get the beavers out, and there is definitely concern that if beavers shut down I-70, that's a very, very expensive problem. Um, so in this report to Colorado Department of Transportation, there was a lot of emphasis on learning to coexist with the beavers that were already there, because at least that's predictable. You know where the dams are. If it's too much ponding, put a pond leveler in, um, take the level down, leave it. If you're constantly in this cycle of scrape out all the beaver dams, kill the beavers or move the beavers, new beavers are going to come in. They're going to build in new places. You're going to have new ponding. You're going to repeat. And it's like a guessing game every year. Where are the beavers going to be? Where's the dam going to be? It's much more chaotic and difficult to manage than if you at least have this population that you are not just letting them have free reign of the roads. We can't shut down the highways, um, but you know where they're working and you can anticipate it and you can use your own human engineering like a pond leveler to make sure that it doesn't become destructive. Um, so other states are doing this. I know Colorado's example because I talked to the folks that wrote that report, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's similar documents floating around in the gray literature elsewhere. Um, okay, I think this is a typo. I'm going to take a plunge here. Will temperature rise be a limiting factor in reestablishing beaver populations? It can be. Um, there was a good study out of Canada that looked at one of their national parks, and they counted the number of beavers they currently had, and they modeled the sort of habitat suitability of their landscape and found that in the next 50 years, it's going to become less suitable for beavers. Um, it's going to dry up, you're going to have a shift in vegetation, uh, and beavers are not going to want to be there, which is part of why we see them going north, why they're going to the Arctic. It's good habitat, and some of the places that used to be good habitat are not anymore, either because of things like global temperature rise or because of us um, making it bad habitat for them. So, um, yes, it will get harder for beavers, but when the beavers are established, they're really good at creating microclimates around themselves that are cooler and wetter. They can maintain these wetland ecosystems in Arizona right now, in Mexico, in New Mexico, in uh, Nevada, in Southern California, in really, really dry, really, really hot places. I've been to beaver ponds when it's 110 degrees outside um, and it hasn't rained in four months and the beavers are fine. Um, so yes, it will get harder for them, but they're really, really good at dealing with it. And I don't know uh, if it gets to the point where it's so hot that beavers can't deal with it, I'm guessing we're also in a place where we can't deal with it because beavers have been around doing their thing for 7 million years. They have dealt with worse climate change than this um, and they've survived it. I don't want to push them past that because it probably doesn't bode well for us either. Um, we have a follow-up question on the, the vegetation in forested landscapes to um, encourage beavers. Um, so the question was about uh, gap creation or um, opening up gaps so these other species, willows and, and other hardwoods can establish. Um, so is there any information on size or numbers of canopy gaps or how large the gaps should be or sort of a target for that um, to get that forage established? No, 
there is no data on it that I've seen. Um, so if you start making canopy gaps, take some numbers down and let everybody know what it takes for the beavers to move in, because I think it's a question a lot of people would like an answer to. Hey, Zach, there's your spring monitoring grant. Um, okay. Um, somebody said, thank you very much. And uh, we, we all love your cat cubby back there. So um. I know. <laughs> he's been pretty good this whole time. <laughs> um, one follow-up question on something you said, a clarification. Did you say that beavers don't like the taste of willows next to their ponds? Or was there a, a comment on that? Yeah, they, they love fully grown willow, fully grown aspen, um, fully grown poplar. When they cut one of these species, um, so for example, they cut an aspen, even if they take it down to just a little like pencil cone, that aspen stump is going to put out new shoots. And those new shoots that come out of it, like a little cloning bush, um, cottonwoods do this too, willow will do this too. Um, and little new roots come out of it. They hate that taste. It's very, very bitter. Um, and it's not easily digestible. It gives them upset dummies. So when it's really, really young cloning or shooting out like coppicing trees, uh, they don't want to bite that anymore. They want to go for something that's a little bit older and a little more mature. Uh, so they leave it alone. And that's an evolutionary strategy by the trees because the trees have had to deal with beavers for 7 million years. And if they just died every time a beaver cut them, the tree wouldn't be here anymore. So um, the tree stops tasting gross to the beavers when it has its bark back on it and it's more of a fully grown tree again instead of just little sprouts coming out. Um, and at that point, it's safe for the beaver to chew it again because it's got enough energy back in the tree that it can go through that coppicing cycle again. Um, so they like fully developed willow, aspen, et cetera. They don't like the little green shoots that are brand new. Um, so... Emily, I actually have a question. Um, I was wondering in your research, if you also looked at um, recovery after wildfire and if, um, you know, there's beaver uh, engineered wetlands help the surrounding burned landscape recover faster or not? It's a great question. In the original Smokey the Beaver study, so in not super extreme fire, I didn't see a massive difference in recovery afterwards from just an absolute greenness perspective. So plants were able to grow back after fire when the fire is not catastrophic. I did not see that in the mega fire work. Um, those landscapes are still in many places not growing back and we're three years out post fire and it's still just mineral soil. Um, huge difference there because when you had the beaver ponds present, uh, it didn't burn as intensely, even if it wasn't fully preserved away from the beaver ponds, it wasn't as intense. You have a little bit more recovery and you do have these mature plants. So there's some amount of effective rebound that's being facilitated by the beavers. And then uh, Alexa Whipple had a master's thesis that she wrote about post-fire effects at beaver ponds. And in her work, she found that there was a significant effect of the beaver ponds on recovery, and it shifted the plant community towards being more dominated by native plants as opposed to invasive plants, and it did recover uh, more strongly. So there is an effect that happens. Um, the beavers make a difference, especially if it's a more intense fire. Well, I um, I don't know if we have another question, Crispin, that popped in, but we do have time maybe for one, maybe two, if there are any more. Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. We did get one more question. Um, is there, okay, so is there any evidence that we have cut our forest to the degree that the beaver cannot find the size of timber along waterways they need to effectively build dams to withstand the larger flows that occur? We've definitely, uh changed what they have access to building wise. Um, they deal with it. We see beavers build dams out of cattails. We see them build dams out of just mud and stones. Um, in urban settings, we see them build dams out of traffic cones and garbage and baseballs and um, a lot of questionable stuff. Uh, so they'll make it work. The high flow part of it is challenging. Um, if they don't have larger material, that could be wood or stone, uh, it's gonna be harder for them to deal with high flows. And in that kind of a situation, it can be really helpful to do something like a beaver dam analog, put in some posts, support their beaver dams, even if it's just for a couple of years. It doesn't have to be a permanent thing. You can say the posts are going to go in for one year. It's going to let the beavers make it through one tough high flow season. And then you will, we'll go pull the posts out. We won't leave them in forever. But giving the beavers just a little bit more time can be really beneficial in those high flow systems where the material is a little more limited. Okay, I think maybe... Last 
question in the chat um, or Q&A. How healthy, if you know, is the beaver population in Oregon? We don't know. Um, I don't. So uh, until this past year, beavers were classified as a predator in Oregon, um, which meant that they could be killed on private land without a permit and you didn't have to report how many you killed. And uh, that was an intentional designation. Even though beavers are only a predator for trees, they're not a predator for any other animals, they're vegetarians. Um, but what it meant was we had no idea how many beavers are killed year to year. And even if we had a really good estimate on the number of beaver dams we see in the landscape, which we don't, we do not have that count for Oregon. Um, we don't know how many of them are active. We don't know how many beavers are being lost from the system. So there was no way to estimate it. That changed. Um, legislation got through that has made it so you have to at least tell us how many beavers are taken off of the landscape. Um, so I think that going forwards, we, we will know better about the population in Oregon. Uh, in the continental United States, it's 10% of the historic population. So um, nowhere's at 100. Nowhere's ever going to be at 100. We've seriously changed the landscape since they were at their population max with our own developments. But I think that getting back up to 20, 30, maybe even 40% of the historic population is possible uh, and nowhere is like that except for very small patches in very remote places. So I suspect Oregon is somewhere around 10, maybe 15% of the historic population. Okay, well, thank you again, Emily. Um, that's That will wrap up our Q&A session so we can end on time. And um, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that this is a note of positivity, even though climate change and mega fires are not um, positive things that, by any means. It's it's amazing to to hear and know that there is some hope in um, in what we can do to help to help that process uh, not be as painful and, and awful and and regenerate in the future. So thank you. Um, I also want to thank you, Kristen, for helping with the Q and A. Um, uh, it's great to have a partner um, on, on these uh, webinars. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you to all of you who participated. Uh, without you, this wouldn't happen. And um, the quality of your questions makes it that much better. And thank you so much. I am going to put one more link in the chat. Um, make sure I get it to everyone. And that is to our email list. If you're interested in um, hearing about our upcoming events and um, SIPs and Science and other events as well, project tours for those of you that are local, um, please uh, sign up. And, um, and again, this webinar has been recorded. So you will get that email um, without signing up. Uh, you will still get that email about when that is available to view or share. Um, so with that, Thank you very much. Good night. And I hope to see you again on a future webinar.